welcome to a very quiet and rainy day in sunny Arizona. This is so unusual for us. We have rain like this all day long, softly, quietly. Max doesn't have to. We have snow here. First day. First time of the season, snow in Minnesota. Snow? <laughs> yeah. I don't want any snow. No, we have it here first time. One, wonderful season. for you guys. No. no. That's only nice. I welcome you with all my heart, each and every one. You are half the focus. I mean, you are you are very blur. For Buddhists, there is no self. The concept for Buddhists is that there is no self. There is no I. I is just a word referencing this body-mind. There's nothing inside that's a soul or a self. The same for Robert. When asked if there is a soul, he said, no. There's only consciousness. Nisargadatta said the ultimate is nothingness. The I am does not exist in nothingness. Nothingness is beyond the concept I am, the feeling I am. Searching for the self, who you are fundamentally, is called the upward path towards the transcendental. It's investigating all that you know to find the truth for you. So I ask you, how many of you think you have a self or a soul? But if you thought you did have a soul, how would you find it? Is there any way you could find a soul? I guess you could look within and look for the sense of self, the sense of I like I did for over 20 years and find only emptiness, very quiet, calming emptiness. After I left Zen, I went to Muktananda's and he said, honor the self yourself, love yourself, bow to yourself. 
I said to myself, what the hell is he talking about? What is the self? In 20 years of looking, I never found a self. So what was that self that he was honoring? What was that self that he was loving? What was that self? Now, curiously, though Robert said that there was no self, Ramana said that there was a self. And he did an experiment where one day he felt he was dying. It came over him a great fear of death. So he laid on the floor with his arms by his side. He closed his eyes and held his breath. And he said to himself, now that I'm dying, what will happen? They'll cart this body off to the burning pile and incinerate it. But with the death of the body, will I die? And he said, no, the body is quiet, it's inert, but I feel the full force of my life, my personality, a sense of I within me at all times. And he said, since he had that realization, his association with that I sense has remained intact the rest of his life. And he called this the self. So it's kind of confusing. Is there a self or isn't there a self? Now let me do an experiment with you. Close your eyes. And I will call you by name. And when I call you by name, what is your experience? Don't answer. Just note what your experience is. Stevie. Steve. Ken. You hear me? Max. Max. You hear me? Enrique. Do you hear me? B. B. What do you experience when you hear me call you? B. Where do you feel it? Spencer. Where do you feel whatever happens in you when I call your name? Mark. Where is the response coming from? Maria. Big reaction. Maria, where did that reaction come from? Where did you feel it? Bart. Barty. Vaselina. Michael. Walker. Patrick, BJ, now, any of you, 
where did you feel a response or did you feel a response inside of you? Like when you wake up in the morning to an alarm clock. Is there a response somewhere in you? Is it in your head? Is it in your heart? Is it in your body at all? Mind makes everything. Mind creates everything. If you think you may have a self, you could search for it for a hundred years and find many levels of self within yourself, ultimately coming to emptiness. If no one has filled you with the idea that you have a self, you'd be free from that search. You wouldn't have to search for yourself. So do you have a self or not? I know that in 1995, after practicing the koan, who am I for 27 years? While taking a shower, I looked within and asked myself, who is it that feels the water touching the skin of my back? And suddenly everything fell away. All that I experienced was a vast emptiness. And there was no who anywhere. My mind can't became convinced that there was no I anywhere. And with that came great fear because I realized that deep down inside, I believed that a, an I was there, an entity of some sort within. And all that I had to do was look within long enough to find it, to reach the truth, the discovery of the self. There was nothing but emptiness, quietness, no thoughts. No sense of self, just a vast emptiness that destroyed the boundary between inside or the subjective and outside and the objective. All was just one consciousness. And everything within consciousness was an illusion created by the mind. But we give words to all the objects in the room and around us, names. And we give them names. They gain a certain stability, a convenience. But if we have no names, We operate in a world of unknowing, of complete idiocy. But we do so perfectly. I can walk through the door over there perfectly without a name for it. I could accept a cup of tea from Max without knowing his name, what he was or who he was. We can function perfectly without language, 
And when we don't believe in the solidity of language, everything changes. We enter a world of magic. Where everything is constantly changing and flowing. And there are mysterious energies everywhere and there is no self anywhere. But then, 15 years later, I found myself. Through love, love of another, love of Janet. because I saw something in her. I saw her spirit. I saw her life. I felt her love of me. And I loved her because she loved me. I saw in her spirit, the life force, life itself. Not as something separate, as an entity inside our body, but as something spiritual, transcending the body. And when I knew it in her and I worshiped it in her, I felt such love. And I was swept by love. And I gained an identity. No longer as this body mind called Ed, but I became love itself. The feeling of love and devotion and surrender. I recognize myself as a spiritual being constantly associated with the body. But the strange thing was the spiritual being had no name. It wasn't I, it wasn't me, it wasn't Ed. It wasn't that fat guy sitting over there. It was just me. The same one that heard me calling your name. That instant reaction where you know what I was asking. And maybe you felt inside part of you that responded. Nisar Gadara said, the self is not one thing. It's many things. It's like a city, he said. One aspect of the self is the ability to hear and to recognize somebody's voice. Another aspect of the self is the one who is able to see and read. Another aspect of the self is the one that's being able to judge the speed of moving objects so that you can cross the street without being run over. Another that's able to read a book or to listen to a symphony. It's not one thing or one ability, it's many. The ability to do arithmetic, the ability to do calculus, the ability to do physics, the ability to work with wood as a carpenter, or mechanics working with an auto engine. It's intelligence. It's the ability to move and to act. 
It's the life, life force within us. Manifesting through this body mind. It's the one that knows I am alive. Indeed, the sense of self grew in me more and more strongly the more I love Janet, filling me every day with more and more power, more and more witnessing the life force within me. Till one day the life force was happy with my efforts and decided to show itself to me in a kind of magical form like lights and electricity and power, which was so powerful, I called it other. I called it God because it couldn't be me. It was too big, too powerful. And from that day forward, I always had God with me. the divine, the supreme life force. And me. So, I was not an I like I had thought when I lost it with Robert in emptiness. But I was the sentience, the ability to feel and to think that emerged out of that total vacuum of emptiness. I was born to new knowledge of myself as the life force of sentience. It's the power of life living through me. Altogether, it took me 42 years took me 42 years to discover this aspect of myself. So I was both emptiness and I was sentience, but there's no individual. That is Ed. Individuality is only associated with the body. But the spirit within is universal. And all of us exist within a matrix of language and communication that creates an artificial world, which we call real. But is really a mirage superimposed on an ever moving underlying energies. So right now, Angela is going through, uh, you might say, a dark night of the soul. Because Remco told her she had a soul. And if she isn't careful, she could lose it. And if she lost her soul, she would go to hell and die a miserable death and be consigned to hell forever. But it's difficult to know what would be consigned to hell forever if she was something separate from her soul. Which one is consigned to hell forever? The soul that was lost? Or the Angela that was supposedly possessed the soul and is worried about where her soul is?
Sansanim said, mind creates everything. If you create the idea of a soul, you have to live with the consequences of that idea. If you understand and believe in karma, you are doomed to see everything in terms of karma. If you don't believe in an individual self, and if you don't believe in the concept of karma, you have no bounds, no boundaries, no prison. But if you believe in karma, then you have to be careful about everything you say and do for fear that it rebounds on you. So you develop a constant monitor watching what you say and what you do. The same thing about an afterlife. People who say that you go to heaven or hell or purgatory. But what is it that goes there? A soul? Is the soul the same thing as how I perceive my life force in me now? This life force that is embodied in this body goes to the pearly gates and asks to be let in. But how can it ask without a body speaking, a voice? How could it see the pearly gates without physical eyes? How can it hear St. Peter's voice without ears? Or do suddenly we have an ability for that spirit to hear, speak, see without a physical body? Or would our spirit be blind and deaf and greatly afraid because it doesn't know what's going on? It doesn't have any senses. It's totally alone with no sensory input. Wouldn't that scare the hell out of you? To be in infinite space or wherever, infinite darkness, unable to know if you're up or down, sideways, to know whether you're alive or dead because there's no body to feel, no sunshine to see, no words to hear to give us comfort that we're all right but totally alone with our thoughts. Now we're dead. What the hell's gonna happen now? Our thoughts create all of these problems of fear. Angela's afraid of being lost forever. She makes the wrong choice to follow this way to God of Robert Adams and the energy people that followed. Or Remco, who talks about fallen angels, dark souls, lighted souls, spiritual entities, and that he is an intermediary, the only intermediary for them with God, the spokesperson for God. Whose story is more credible? Why would you believe one or the other over the other? What if you had no stories? There would be no fear, no confusion. Which story is true? Which story is true? So I tell you the antidote. There is no true story. The only truth is that there is no truth. And beware even of that truth. In other words, let go of understanding as being of any aid to you in living your life. Instead, live it as it comes. And fears come. You boldly walk into that fear and feel the fear. If confusion comes, you boldly walk into the confusion and feel what it is 
fully. If jealousy comes, envy comes, sadness comes, depression comes, boldly walk into them. knowing they have no power except what your mind gives them. Your mind creates fear. Your mind creates confusion. Your mind creates what ifs. What if I have a soul? What if it can be lost? Well, so what if I lose my soul? What happens to me now? Am I unable to function? Did part of me drift away that I feel now that suddenly it's not there anymore? And what happens then? Is it like Renko said, that gradually the physical body and the mental body decline and disappear a horrible death because some sort of essence is missing? Similar question is, what religion do you believe in? Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Scientology, the crap music is talking about. What's real? What's real, Veselina? You ask that all the time, and that's the right question. What's real? Music is bullshit. Remco's bullshit, the Sermon on the Mount, the Old Testament, the Sufis, everybody's got an idea and they want you to learn their idea and follow their idea as being more accurate or more true than other ideas. It becomes a war of ideas war of one convention against another convention. So what is true? What is truth? What if there is no truth? Imagine that there's no truth. There's no rules to live by. No prophet to follow. No God to genuflect to. There's only you living without words and concepts. Just getting up in the morning, having breakfast. Going to work or going to meditation free of any obligation or you can take on obligation if you want just because you want to fit in or for some other reason. You can decide to live a conventional life and be a part of society and at the same time be entirely removed from it because you don't believe in it. It's a make-believe thing you put on to live in this society, but you can be free of it. Now, are there any questions? Can you talk about uh, Hara? About what? Hara. The belly? Yeah. The location where you point and you... I've been doing it past uh, three days, I think, some sort of, or four days, some sort of uh, chanting at Hara or two inches below the novel position. And, and uh, like about 500 times. 
and I experience some sort of sensation there combining with heart uh, center and it makes me like <sighs> like I go it's heaviness and I feel like to just stay like that uh, I don't know what it is there is no flashes lights whatever whistles and all that but there is that sensation um, that makes it like this makes it feel powerful um makes it my mind goes numb which i like it because as long as as long as something makes my mind go silent is what i like so this makes me so peaceful means like just stay there and experience that quietness or stillness What do you want me to say about it? It's a good thing um, to do. Uh, so that two inch below the novel is that the location that we? I I was searching on internet um, about that, and I could find like two inch below. I'm not really sure whether it's right or not. It doesn't make any difference. There are so many different stories and theories. You can find one that will say two finger breaths below the navel, one that'll say four finger breaths, one that'll say your balls, it'll say anything. Two fingers above, the, the, it doesn't matter. It's a concept. What is important is your feeling and your experience, what's real to you. Now, commonly in Zen, it's stated that Hara, that place there should be the center of your attention. You should, when you walk, walk with your mind in your belly. Speak with your mind in your belly. Listen with your mind in your belly because you'll be more grounded into your body instead of off somewhere thinking about something or other. And like you say, when you're in your belly, your mind stops, becomes quiet. Because your attention is in your belly, not in your head where your mind is. The mind has a physical location. It's in the brain. And when you're thinking, your attention is in your brain, even though the thoughts may seem to be out there somewhere. When you're thinking, your attention is in your brain. If you move your center of gravity of attention downwards into your body, the mind just fades away and becomes a distant conversation. If the center of your attention is in your heart, you're going to be more sensitive to emotions. If the center of your attention drops lower into your gut, you won't feel emotions anymore. You'll feel power. The power of the life force. Joriki power developed by meditation is swirling in your gut. The more you meditate, the more power you build in your gut. Joriki. So for you, that is a perfect thing to practice. But I would also drop my attention, if I were you, into my balls, into my penis, because they have an enormous amount of energy behind them, the sexuality. And then when your sexuality is connected to your hara, and then it connects to the heart, you have a very powerful primary circuit in you that you've opened up. So you've only got to drop down another eight or nine inches. Continue with your attention downwards and connect your genitals with your hara, with your heart. And that'd be good enough for now. Just do it over and over and over again. Imagine energy going from your balls to your hara, to your heart, 
and then down outside back again into your genitals, into your harem, and into your heart, circulating. Inside sure. going up, outside going down. Um, that's a. Uh... I have been suffering with the same thing that you are telling me to do it, which I have been trying to avoid uh, for almost like some uh, few years now. Now I have to go back to what you are saying, just to energize or, you know, the whole life I have been bogged down by that second chakra activity and uh, now ex i only have in my body only just the second chakra going on nothing else what do you mean um, your second chakra um the same thing i've been um experiencing this sexual stuff and just wanted to i've been trying to avoid or um, you know, just control somehow so my attention could lift up to different places. So you've been avoiding it, you said. Yeah. Um, Incorporate it. Use that energy to rise into your heart and into your heart. Okay. But yeah, I think probably. Don't ignore it because that's cutting you off from some very basic power in you. But it's a, it's more like a uncontrollable thing, and I have to control somehow. I have to uh, use it, but it, it, for me, it is like not controllable. You have you fantasies know I mean? about what? What are you going to do? Become a pedophile? To become a rapist? No, nothing like that. But still, you know, that over activity, I don't want to in, indulge in. Indulge it. Just swim in that sexual energy. You will be so invigorated. So what you're saying is just to hold it, control it, and just use it. Don't experience. worry about controlling it. Feel it okay. totally. Feel the sexual energy without doing anything. Feel it energizing your whole body by paying attention to it. Feel it like this. I feel my penis. I feel my balls. And it feels pleasurable to feel them, the sensation in my balls. It feels erotic. I feel the sexual energy. And women can feel the same thing for themselves from their genitals. I feel my pussy. I feel it tingling in my pussy. And it reaches up into my womb. And the energies become one there. I become aroused. I become wet. And the man feels an erection coming on. feels his penis growing, his desire for a woman growing. His desire is so strong, he can't think of anything else except having sex. But instead of having sex or thinking about it, you sink even more into the sensations of sexual arousal. And you don't do anything. You don't need to control it. You just need to feel it fully. Feel it yeah, more. I need, I need to practice that. So uh, just feel it. Uh, let, me finish, notice. let me finish. Let me finish. Just listen. Sorry, go ahead. Just feel the energy crawling inside of your genitals and mixing with the energy in the hara and going up into your heart. And women feel it from your vagina going up into your gut and then into your heart. Feel your sexuality. Don't be afraid of it. Don't cut me off by asking a question. 
That's what you're trying to do is to stop the feelings from arising in you, BJ. You don't like the feelings, but you have to like it. Enjoy it. You don't have to do it all at once. You can play with it a little bit at a time. Under. Any other questions? Hello, <clears throat> hello, Ed. I'm just gonna uh, ask a few things. Um, okay, so my practice is going well, and I uh, easily abide in the in the uh, sense of self, the I am, that that field of oneness of bliss of of space and and okayness and everything is all right and uh, um you were talking about what to believe in well obviously when i go into the state there's nothing left to do it's just it's self-validating it just feels so right and so good i could stay in that state for hours sometimes so my question to you is um is there such a thing as meditating too much i do probably about two hours a day off and on also uh i'm assuming that i'm to keep this state going or a, a degree of the state going all the time if i can if it's doable and for me it's by concentrating on the tops of my feet which seems to be the primary entrance for the for the energy into my field into my being your question is then uh, is, there, is there such a thing as doing too much? If I feel like doing a lot, if I feel like practicing continuously, not necessarily meditating, but abiding in the expanded, in the, in the sense of the I am and the bliss in the space on an ongoing basis, is there any danger of getting carried away? Is there any danger of overdoing it? No, none. Okay, good, good. That answers my question then. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. I want to try another experiment. This is something entirely different related to love. When I love Janet, she loved me back. What changed was the way we expressed our love for each other. I love you changed. Our voices changed. Because our attention dropped into our hearts. And it wasn't a mere word anymore but we expressed it from the love we felt deep inside of us. So the expression came out, I love you. I love you with all my heart, all my soul. I love you so much. I love you. And this voice that I heard from her had such magical effect on me. It wasn't a bold, I love you. It came from her heart, her total devotional love. Now, when I say that to each and every one of you, like that, what do you feel when I say I love you? I love you, Vesselina. I love you, Stevie. I love you, Kim. I love you, VJ. I 
love you, party. I love you, Max. I love you, Enrique. I love you, P. I love you, Maria. Even when you talk to others constantly during our sunset. I love you, Muhammad. I don't know who you are, G, but I wish I could love you, but I don't know who you are. Sindria, I love you. I really love you. I love you, I love you. Can you feel it? Can you feel love at a deeper level? Feel totally loved. Like for the first time in your life to feel love. very personally, like whispering in your ear so that only you can hear, I love you. I love you so much with all my heart. I love you. I love you. Are there any questions? Okay. I'll see you on Thursday at 11. And remember, I do love you. Sometime I'll whisper in your ears. Bye-bye.